Did you know that just seven people control the whole internet? And with those keys, you can shut down and reboot the internet. We've been hearing a strange tale about seven people who have fragments of some kind of master key to switch off or restart the internet. Get in, nerd. We're going to the internet. Let's go! Yeah! <laughs> it's locked! Okay, all right, uh, I gotta give you guys some context on this because I understand that this probably makes very little sense. So uh, let me tell you a little story. So a number of months ago, maybe back in June or something, I'm sitting in Seattle with some friends and I kind of want to order a pizza. And generally when you want to order a pizza, you have a couple of options. You can either call up the pizza place, you can use an app or you can go on the internet. Now, sometimes I look at the very long list of top level domains that you can possibly buy. You know, there's like .com and .net and .org, but there's actually like a massive list of domains. There's things like .joy and .monster and .fun. So in my brain, I'm thinking, all right, well, there is a dot pizza. I remember there being a dot pizza. So what if I just went to pizza dot pizza? Like this has got to be owned by Domino's or Papa John's or something like that, right? I go to pizza dot pizza and it does not resolve. And usually when this happens, that means it's available. So I go to try to buy it and I can't buy it. It's already taken or something. It's, it's not for sale. So I'm a little bit confused and I do what's called a who is lookup on pizza dot pizza. And generally, the information of who bought a domain is like publicly available. There's ways to make this not publicly available. You can obscure it. You can go through like some third party company and the information is obscured. But as I'm reading down this who is lookup, I keep seeing these names like Donuts Inc. and I can and they seem like these very like strange, obscure names. I have a whole podcast about this over on Waveform and you should definitely go watch Waveform and I'm not going to go into as much detail in this video as I did on the Waveform episode. But one of the interesting tidbits that I found while falling down this rabbit hole was this weird story of this organization that holds these secret meetings every three months and it's in this obscured location and you can't film going up to the location and there's these seven key holders of the internet that can take down the internet at any given time. And it just sounds like a really weird process, right? This sounds like a James Bond, like 007 or like CSI type thing. Didn't make a lot of sense. And here at the studio, we weren't just gonna like assume this was real, right? We were gonna go there and try to figure out what the heck was happening. So that's, uh, that's exactly what we did. We went to save the internet. What's up, internet? Um, three chicken sandwich. Mm -hmm. wow. It was a good decision. Get vegetables, chicken, gravy, and bread. Cultured individuals such as myself have been enjoying slow roasted meats. What the fuck are you talking about? Alright, so this key holder situation happens every three months. Uh, sometimes it's in Virginia, sometimes it's in LA. This month it happens to be in Virginia and we've been trying to get to the ceremony for a very long time. We were finally able to get access. So we want to see, is it actually what the internet says it is? So this whole thing about it being a secretive seven key holders of the internet just didn't really seem correct. So we decided we were just going to come see what was really real. Good morning. Today we're going to the internet. We're finally uh, well rested, got our coffee. So come on down to the magical cafe of Adams. 19 something something. That's a 2004. 2004. 2014, damn it. <laughs> oh boy, really? Now the level of security at these ceremonies is actually really insane. Uh, as you're driving up to the facility, there's a bunch of security cameras and you're not allowed to film driving up to the facility. You're not allowed to film at the facility. You're not allowed to film inside the facility until you get into the super secure room where the ceremony actually happens. Now ICANN itself doesn't necessarily sign 
all of these websites. Those are signed by other people, but I can is signing the signatures. Okay, so if we're gonna understand what's happening here, you kind of have to understand DNS or the domain name system. Now, it might not seem like it, but most of the internet, you know, all the websites that you go to every single day are actually just being hosted on like a ton of different servers all over the world. And each of those individual servers has an IP address. That's like an individualized address so that your computer knows how to get to that website or how to get to that server. But when you type in a website like shop.mkbhd.com, you're not going to shop.mkbhd.com because that's not the IP address of that server. And so your computer has to figure out what is the IP address of shop.mkbhd.com. And that's where the domain name system comes in. So a very high level overview of what's happening here is your computer should be caching these translations of websites to IP addresses, but it also clears the cache every now and then. And so if it does, it has to go to the DNS to ask what the IP address is. Now the first step out of your computer is your internet service provider server, which is called a recursive server. And that is basically bouncing back and forth between a bunch of different DNS servers until it finally finds the translation of shop.mkbhd.com to the actual IP address that you're looking for. This whole system was whipped up in the really early days of the internet, back when it was still mostly a research project. So security wasn't really a problem here, but as soon as commercial traffic started going all over the internet, obviously security became a major problem. And in 2010, there was a major security flaw that was found by this guy named Dan Kaminsky, and that flaw is called DNS cache poisoning. Now basically what DNS cache poisoning is, is say you have your internet service provider server and it's sending out a query to the DNS and it says, hey, I wanna find out what this IP address is. This is query number 1000. Now the servers will send back an answer to query 1000, right? But imagine you're a hacker and you've got this nefarious server and it's just spamming like, oh, I've got the answer to query number 1000 through 2000. Then it's possible for your internet service provider to cache the fake IP address of something like shop.mkbhd.com instead of the actual IP address. And that allows the hacker to do a lot of different things. Imagine that nefarious server says that it knows where to find your bank's website, right? So you go to your bank, say chase.com, and it comes up with this page, that's login page for chase.com. And you enter your information, you put your username and your password, and then you hit enter. And what's actually going on here is that the nefarious server served you a fake version of chase.com with a login page and you just gave them your information and then they can just forward you to the real chase.com and you have no idea that that even happened in the first place. That's gonna be a pretty major issue because a lot of people use their internet service provider to be able to find websites, right? So that ISP could be serving a ton of different people this fake bank website, and then all of a sudden these hackers are just stealing everybody's information. So ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is sort of this governing body that oversees the internet that was whipped up in 1998, had to come up with a solution for this because the internet is really based on trust. And if nobody trusts that they're going to be able to go to their real bank's website or the real twitter.com or the real facebook.com or the real uh, shop.mkbhd.com, then I don't know, they're probably just not gonna use the internet. And that's that's a big problem. So ICANN's solution for this hack is something called public key cryptography. And I don't wanna go too into detail here, but effectively what they're doing is signing the DNS root zone. Now signing is basically stamping that for approval. It's saying this is the real version of this website. Now ICANN itself doesn't necessarily sign all of these websites. Those are signed by other people. But ICANN is signing the signatures. I know it is kind of complicated. It's multi-level cryptography effectively, because if it was just single level, that could maybe be brute forced at some point, but because they're signing it on multiple levels and they're the like end all last resort kind of authority figure, it makes it a lot more secure. Now, the cool thing is that ICANN has this huge facility where they have this crazy three to four hour process with this script and they've got these safes and they've got all of these processes that take two to three people at the same time to make each individual step happen. And that kind of ensures that with digital security plus physical security, you can be almost 100% sure that nothing is gonna happen to these cryptographic keys. 
When you enter that secure space, you actually need multiple people's iris scans just to open the door to allow people into the room. And that's to prevent one single person from being in the room by themselves. Now, when you walk into the actual ceremony room, you've got all of these chairs that are lined up because a lot of different people are supposed to be in that room to make sure the ceremony is going as planned. And then in the front, what all these people are facing is these one or two people that are actually officiating the ceremony. And what they're doing is going down this incredibly detailed script. This is a script that has like 50 plus different steps on it and it takes three to four hours to complete. And every single time one, one of these steps is completed on the script, everyone in the room is supposed to sign their name and date the time in which that step was completed so that you have all of these points where people say that is exactly the thing that was supposed to happen and that is when it happened. There's one person there that is the only person that knows the combination to a safe. And inside of that safe is a safety deposit box. And there's another person there who is the only person that knows the combination to that safety deposit box. And inside of that safety deposit box is some parts to build a computer. And the other parts are in some other safe and safety deposit box. And there's all these individual people and they build this air gapped computer and boot it with the CD-ROM so they can actually generate this cryptographic key. And the crazy thing is, a lot of these people don't even live on the same continent. Like they have a very specific role to play in this incredibly detailed ceremony, but they don't communicate with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Like there is very, very little chance that they're gonna be trying to like collectively destroy the internet. So a lot of the internet would kind of like you to believe that this entire process is super secretive and shady and kind of weird. Like there's these secret key holders that could just take down the internet at any time. But when we actually went to the ceremony, we found out it's pretty much the polar opposite. And it's actually all about transparency. Funny enough, all of these key signing key ceremonies are on the internet. There's a transcript available before you even start the process. They live stream it on YouTube. You can comment in real time as they're doing it. There's like seven different camera angles so you can see every little thing that each different trusted community representative is doing. It's actually this incredibly transparent process, which is actually kind of beautiful because it's like a maximal amount of security while at the same time being as transparent as possible so that people know that they can use the internet and there aren't gonna be any problems. So no, these seven people don't control the internet. The worst that could probably happen is that ICANN doesn't sign these root keys and a hacker could eventually brute force their way into a DNS cache poisoning attack. And then the internet would just be a little bit less secure. But that's actually a lot more important than you might think because the internet is really built on trust. And if people can't trust the internet they're using, that's a big problem for all of us. As to whether or not I eventually got pizza.pizza, that's something you're gonna go have to watch the uh, Waveform podcast for. So make sure you head over to the Waveform channel and check that out, or you know, listen to it on your favorite podcast player. But uh, until next time, thanks for helping us save the internet. Smash that like button. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, step three is complete. Uh, 17 hours.